the global platform economy. My name is Valentin Niebler. I'm a researcher at Humboldt University of Berlin. Uh, and yeah, a warm welcome from my side uh, to both the on-site and uh, the online audience. Uh, on tonight's topic, the regulation, uh, we so we will talk about regulation of uh, platform companies. The issue of, of, of regulation has, I think, become a crucial issue uh, for workers, for unions, and for policymakers over the last few years. Uh, from California's AB5 leg legislation to the UK, uh, UK uh, Supreme Court ruling on Uber, companies in the platform economy, uh, such as Uber, such as Airbnb, uh, etc., have encountered increasing legal challenges uh, to their employment and management practices from regulators across the world. Um, we've been talking about um, this issue on the winter school that is going on at the moment, uh, Fairberg Winter School, um, uh, quite intensively. The platform economy, uh, so it seems, then um, appears to have entered a new phase. Uh, no regulation appears not an option anymore, um, also thanks to worker struggles and their awareness raising. At the same time, we can see in research um, that regulation is also sometimes strategically um, undermined, both uh, existing regulation and new regulation. Um, and I think that, that raises a couple of, of questions, um, the situation and, and what we observe. Um, in, what, in what direction are, um, are these regulative efforts um, developing? How can these um, efforts be interpreted? Um, how will the tensions between platforms and regulators um, evolve and um, how can I think that's that's very important how can we ensure that new regulation uh, truly benefits uh, gig workers and um, for that uh, we will yeah on the, on this issue we will hear uh, a keynote tonight um, I will quickly introduce our speakers tonight's keynote will be held by Johanna Wenkebach uh, Johanna is the scientific director of the Hugo Sinsheimer Institute, a research institute of the union-oriented uh, Hans Böckler Foundation in Germany. Johanna is a legal scholar by training and has taught, published, and researched at several chairs of labor law and social law. Um, before her current position, she has worked in several law firms and has been a union secretary, I hope I'm translating it right, at IG Metall. Uh, the biggest uh, union in Germany. We're happy uh, to have you here tonight, Johanna. Thanks for coming. Hi, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> thanks. And um, after the keynote, we will hear um, yeah, a, quick, a quick response um, to the keynote. We can unfortunately not um, hear Kelly Holson uh, tonight as, expect, as we actually expected. Uh, she could not join us tonight uh, due to cap travel restrictions uh, and corona. Um, but we have a replacement. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, um, thanks for coming, Alessio Bertolini. Um, Alessio is a postdoctoral researcher at uh, the Fairwork Foundation. His research interests are comparative political economy and sociology of work and he will give us a bit of a yeah interpretation or yeah response to what has been said after these two inputs the floor will be open for questions from the audience um, and we will also try to integrate questions coming in online so you can wherever you are listening to this at the moment um, post questions and engage in the discussion um, that's it from my side so far. I would now uh, give the floor to Johanna. Yes, thank you for having me and for the nice introduction. Uh, I'll start with a disclaimer. Um, this uh, is going to be uh, not a visual experience, just a listening experience because I didn't prepare a PowerPoint presentation, so you will just be with my words. and. Uh, the second thing I'd like to do is a little advertisement block for the homepage of my institute, Hugo Sinsheimer Institute, because we're doing research also in the field of, of course, fair work, but especially um, 
cross-platform work, we have um, some texts and uh, research results in English. We do a report, for example, on European labor law, like actual developments by the European courts. And uh, we just published a text on um, union rights in a digitalized uh, working world. And uh, soon to come is um, a research on artificial intelligence in working life, which I think is very connected to the subjects we also talk about today. So far, and then, yes, uh, you gave me a big uh, topic. Uh, and having, you gave me, I think, 40 minutes. I forgot my time, so you have to stop me when I'm too long. I didn't bring a, a clock. But um, I can already give the disclaimer out that 40 minutes are too short to really go deeply into all the legal issues we have concerning gig work. So what I'll try to do is give an overview um, over, we had some really interesting court decisions in Germany that I want to talk about. And actually, um, the new government is planning regulation. It was quite advanced with concrete plans to change labor law, and I will talk about that, talk about the right to strike in the gig economy, and I hope there will be enough time uh, for discussions and questions. Well, Moving towards regulation, what do we see? Regulating workers' rights um, has always been a cause for dispute. In this aspect, the gig economy doesn't provide nothing new, actually. But what is new in the gig economy is the technical possibilities used by enterprises, especially those techniques to exercise power over workers. That makes it harder to apply existing labor law, which at least in Germany was basically made when artificial intelligence was science fiction uh, and basically took place in movies only. But the good news is high courts for labor law around the world are dealing with what is happening in reality of working life in the 21st century and they are applying existing laws in many cases in favor of workers. Um, I will come back to those good examples um, of court decisions in detail later. First, I want to give a small glimpse on the gig economy as the legal field we're talking about. And I know you've been discussing this all the time, you're researching on the subject. I'm scared I'll bore you, but in case there's somebody online who's not so deeply in the field, I'll just say some words. Um, to, to de describe the field we're talking about. Because what makes regulation complicated in that field is that it's inconsistent. Um, the tasks given out by platforms differ greatly concerning the qualification they require, concerning the amount of time that needs to be invested, and concerning the money being paid out to workers. What also varies strongly, as researchers already found out, is the motivation of workers. There are people gaining their monthly income with gig economy tasks, working in the amount of a full-time job. But then there's also students or people who actually have another employment relationship who work as gig workers, crowd workers in their free time. Um, and there are researchers who found out that they do actually crowd working just for fun, to say. So um, some platform workers struggle intensely to have their status as workers accepted in order to gain basic rights, such as protection against dismissal, minimum wage, parental leave, sick pay, health protection. All this is connected to the legal status as a worker. Others are proud to be self-employed and identify as their own bosses and um, they are not longing um, to be qualified as workers and I think we have to have this in mind when we talk about regulation. So the starting point makes clear that um, a one-size-fits-all regulation is not possible in the field of gig and crowd work. We need regulation for different types of working contracts and working conditions. What is clear, though, is that platform work is neither a temporary phenomenon on the labor market nor a marginal sector. 
The number of people gaining income in the gig economy is rising constantly. Companies such as the German unicorn startup Gorillas, you probably discussed it before and I'll come back to the case later, they sum up huge amounts of money by investors who obviously believe in the future of this type of economy. The earnings of delivery service, services exploded during Corona crisis. Turnover in the online food trade in Germany rose by 58% to 4.5 billion euros last year. Um, thanks par in part to the Corona crisis, but it's unlikely, I think, that people will stop ordering food online once everything is open again after the crisis. And looking at big cities in the US or China, I think, gives us a glimpse on how developments could be in big European cities and other parts of the world as well. Just here in Berlin, we have more than 2,000 riders um, so far. And I think you fair work researchers um, have all the data about who is actually working in that field. And we, for example, know it's many migrant workers which is a relevant aspect concerning the enforcement of labor law. So at the same time of these rising economic um, developments, struggles of workers are escalating and rising a lot of public attention. Not only in Germany, the working conditions in the gig economy already made it to the high labor courts. And this is not a coincidence. Elections in the work councils, unfair dismissals, strikes, and fights about the legal status of workers are subject of legal disputes across the country, and I think it's not exaggerated to say across the world. Again, these labor law conflicts and illegal employer strategies exist in all economic sectors. It's not like special for gig or crowd work. But legal insecurities arising from the use of di digital technologies aggravate the difficulties in enforcing workers' rights. And that is relevant for what I want to discuss here tonight. I believe what is happening in the gig economy may also be issue in other economic areas in the future. For example, in classical industries. Um, which are already deeply involved, actually, with platforms and platform work. What we see is that labor unions are active in the field and doing organizing. Looking at Germany, we have the food sector union, NGG, which is organizing riders in the food delivery sector. They started the action in the group Liefern am Limit. You might have heard of them. They have successfully accompanied the establishment of works councils and also conducted many legal proceedings in this regard. And they are now heading for a first collective agreement in the field, uh, which would be really the first one in that sector in Germany. So they are organizing with this um, aim. The service sector union Verdi here in Germany is already organizing self-employed people for many years. According to their own information, they have over 30,000 members in the union who are self-employed. The union offers counseling, especially for solo self-employed and is addressing especially crowd workers to become members and get advice and help. Germany's largest labor union, IG Metall, actually responsible for the metal and electrical uh, industry, um, started a cooperation with the Internet Mov Movement YouTubers Union that you might have heard of too. IG Metall already set up the project crowdsourcing in 2015 and agreed on a crowdworking code of conduct. This code of conduct has been signed by nine platforms so far and um, is officially supported by something that can be seen as the Platform Employers Association, Deutscher Crowdsourcing Verband. An Ombuds office was set up in 2017. The office is a mediator between crowdsourcing uh, platforms and crowd workers. 
and um, they seek to find fair solution, solutions to disagreements by consensus. And then in 2020, FairTube um, started. They also have a homepage, you can get further details. They started a campaign for fairness and transparency for all YouTube creators. The campaign was a collaboration between the YouTubers Union and this crowdsourcing project of IG Metall. And then there are also new forms of collectives of workers beyond the umbrella of trade unions uh, in Germany, the DGB, which is the trade unions alliance. An example that is attracting a lot of attention is the Gorillas Workers Collectives. They describe themselves as precarious workers organizing for fair working conditions at Gorillas app on their Twitter account which has more than 14,000 followers um, in less than one year. And um, I think you have a guest from them on Thursday in this talk series, and I'm really excited also to hear her perspective on what's going on in their field because they're really moving a lot um, these days. Um, both courts, politics, press, and society. So, now let's have a closer look at what's happening at the labor courts. Um, I want to um, point out here tonight two groundbreaking decisions of the German High Labor Court. Um, the first one was the precedent case on the legal status of a crowd worker decided in December 2020. The crowd worker had carried out 2,978 tasks for a platform. The platform, I think it was published, so it's not a secret, uh, was Romla. Um, and Romla deleted the account of the claimant after they had a disagreement on a certain task. But the job was his living income. And um, he claimed um, at the labor court that he was unfairly dismissed. The facts, um, on the basis of a basic agreement and of course general terms and conditions, um, the suit platform offers micro jobs via an app. By opening a personally, personally set up account, each user of the online platform can accept orders um, related to specific tasks they hand out. It's mainly about um, looking, for example, if a gas station is putting the tobacco in the right order that the, company, the tobacco companies paid for, for example. Um, if the crowd worker accepts an order, he must regularly complete the task within two hours. Um, and there are detailed specifications of the crowdsourcer that he has to um, uh, follow. So, was there a working contract? According to German law, an employment relationship exists if the work is bound by directives and is determined by others in personal dependence. That's the, that's the relevant legal term. So, was the crowd worker in that case personally dependent on the platform? The platform argued anyone was free to take on jobs via the app where and whenever. I think we heard this argument by other platforms in other cases uh, around the world uh, as far as I saw. The platform denied being an employer and this is also something we regularly hear by platform uh, companies. I just uh, had a discussion for example with um, the CEO of Helpling, which is um, organizing cleaning services, and they claim to be a notice board for work and not an employer. So I was really, really surprised, and in a good way surprised, by what the German High Labor Court held in that case. They did take a close look on the way the platform did actually exercise power over the workers and found that the conditions for a working contract were met in that case. And the platform in that special case used techniques, digital techniques that we know very well from other platforms. 
So for completed missions handed out by the app, um, experience points were credited to the user's account. The system increases the level with the number of completed missions and allows the acceptance of several missions at the same time. So you have to reach a certain level to be able to do, take over more tasks. By this, the more tasks you complete, of course, the more money you can actually earn. That's what gig economy researchers call gamification. And the court actually took that into account. I was uh, good surprised uh, by that. Um, we, we didn't really expect this would happen, even though, of course, there were researchers in the legal field um, trying to um, explain this. So, in the words of the High Court, I quote, only a certain level in the evaluation system that increases with the number of completed orders enables the users of the online platform to accept several orders at the same time in order to complete them, for example, on one route. Yeah, it's relevant also for delivery services, I think. And thus, in fact, to earn a higher hourly wage. Through this incentive system, the plaintiff was induced to continuously carry out control activities in the district of his user place of residence. So they say there was control and power exercised by the app over the worker. I think that this judgment is a good first step to grasp the new digital tools used by platforms and sum them up under what the law calls personal dependence. But labor lawyers have to think this concept further in a digitalized world, I think. Like, we're not yet like, at the end uh, with uh, organizing this. Industrialization took workers out of their homes and into factories. And it was about taking physical control of working lives. Now, digitalization goes a step further um, and makes the employer's command over the place to work a res less relevant factor for power. Artificial intelligence, AI, now makes it possible to measure the strokes on a computer keyboard uh, of workers. And I think it's no coincidence that the sales of exactly this software uh, is rising continuously since in the crisis more and more people work um, in their home, yeah, in home office work. And in the Romla case that I was talking about, of course, the app was tracking people too. Um, a right to give instructions about where to work is, in my opinion, becoming less crucial in a digitalized working world. And um, because employers track exactly which routes their employees have taken. They can see when they are online um, and they can even see how quickly they complete certain tasks. Also something which is not only true in gig, uh, for, for gig work. So in my, uh, in my opinion, responsibility as an employer must be borne by those who exercise this kind of power and control over people working for them. The second very interesting um, and important judgment by the High Labor Code is really just a few days old. Um, it was a lawsuit led by a Lieferando rider who was supported by his union, NGG, and he was successful. It addresses the problem that even if a platform accepts the legal status of riders to be workers, they try to exclude, exclude actually most of the labor law in terms and conditions. And in the end, employees are treated like self-employed again because they have to bring their own material and repair it on their own costs. So, the High Labor Court of Germany just this week now held that delivery services must provide essential work equipment for riders, a roadworthy bicycle and a suitable phone. 
that was really breaking news, I think, for many writers uh, across uh, the country and maybe even worldwide. And the court stated that, and because this is the practice um, in many of these uh, ride-hailing um, companies and delivery services, that deviations from this principle may be contractually agreed. So you can say, I'm not paying you the repairs for your bicycle, but you get certain money per kilometer. Um, but if this is done, the court ruled, um, in general terms and conditions of the employer, they are only effective if the employee is promised appropriate financial compensation for the use of his or her bicycle and mobile phone. And actually, by arguing this, the court especially referred to the very low income that riders have. And there are similar claims across the country of riders for this ongoing and the chance that they will also be one is very high, I guess. So, with labor unions being active and crowd workers and gig workers winning their cases in courts, do we actually need the lawmaker? I think, yes, we do. And I'm trying to explain now why. Um, both of the cases that I described now, decided in the high court, are the end of a way, very long way of workers to actually be successful and have their rights. Lawsuits will not solve the problems of bad working conditions in the platform economy, is my opinion. Even if courts are willing, and we have good examples, and able to fill gaps in the legal um, regulation system. Why? First, because we know from studies that dependent employees very rarely take legal action against their employer. It's not really surprising, but if you want to keep a work, and especially if you're a precarious worker, people want to keep their work because there's like no second bottom financially. Um, you don't want to sue your, your own employer. And um, in brackets, I think it's very interesting. Um, it was like, because the companies are working very much online, it's very transparent to see how these gig work and crowd work companies spread the vibe of we are family and we're brothers and sisters and we really like each other and there's good music going on. That, that has an impact on the will to um, um, yeah, lean in against uh, structures and um, ignorance of rights. And this, uh, this problem is aggravated when migrant workers do, for example, not have a secure resident status. I mean, people don't like to sue their employer, but especially if it's not even clear if you can stay in the country, you will definitely go for, for trouble. Um, besides that, apps and algorithms are black boxes for workers. The information gap with the platform is huge for workers and under actual law, I think this is probably true for other countries as well, the burden of proof is on the worker, on the person claiming a certain right. So for example, um, it's, it's lawmakers need to um, facilitate enforcement of law by removing this rule on the burden of proof, like by shifting it to the employer. And I think that class action, legal class action, which in Germany is not possible in the labor law field, is needed um, because it takes the burden of a lawsuit, this financial, social and psychological burden, off the shoulders of a single worker. and. Um, can like, uh, enforce something like legal solidarity. And then, yes, the judgments I mentioned are precedent cases with legal effect beyond each individual case. Yeah, they have to be applied in general. But still, each of them is just a decision ba based on the certain facts of each case. And, um, in both cases, general terms and conditions of platforms were of the platforms were decisive for the court decisions. And after both cases, you immediately find publishments 
in uh, all legal um, institutions of big law firms, for example, who offer advice for the platforms how to change their terms and conditions in a way that applies the new court decisions and still doesn't make work more expensive or from the workers' perspective more secure. So I do think that politics have to act and now um, let's, let's have a look on this chapter on what's going on concerning legal regulation, like changes in the actual law. So in September 2019, California, I think many probably have like followed this, passed a law known as AB5 that gave gig workers and other types of freelancers or solo self-employed workers the legal standing of employees. This law was really classified as one of the most important pro-labor acts uh, within decades in the US and there were plans to bring it on to the states of the US. But in November 2020, AB5 was severely weakened when California voters passed Proposition 22 a ballot initiative that implemented a new state law which exempted app-based taxi and delivery drivers from AB5's groundbreaking provisions. Ride-hailing businesses Uber and Lyft along with other food delivery um, um, providers DoorDash, Instacart and Postmates, they spent together astonishing 205 million dollars to pass this ballot measure and I mean unions had this David and Goliath fight uh, about like preventing this and I think this is uh, to keep in mind on how much uh, the companies do not want the regulator to uh, reach out for their obviously um, yeah, um, economic ideas and systems. And then here, in the beautiful capital of startups, Berlin, um, we have Gorillas. Um, I mentioned before this startup that um, uh, is already worth billions um, and is hiring, hiring expensive star lawyers to prevent, um, for example, a works council for their minimum wage workforce riders crew. Yeah. Um, so there is like showing this imbalance in legal enforcement system. And um, actually they lost at the first instance in the labor court and today was the second instance uh, decision this morning and again the gorillas workers collective won the claim so there will be a um, works council now elected um, but the struggle shows and i think it's not a coincidence that this is um, a, a gig work startup um, that is having these struggles with their workforce and so a works council means co-determination and I think that co-determination is extremely um, relevant as a factor for a fairer and more democratic, less discriminating, more secure workplace. It's in my eyes a lever in the direction of more balanced power relations in the working relationship. And I think this is especially important for the platform economy um, but its reality is not really like the reality in the gig work is not covered by the actual law. I can say this at least for Germany because also this law was made like the last, there was a reform last year but it was just cosmetics one can say. So the uh, last big reform was in 1972, the 70s, yeah, it, it, like this this working world by then had nothing to do with an app being a, a boss of people. So um, the reality is not really covered also in the law concerning co-determination. And this is why I think the Spanish law that was just passed, the, the law for riders, 
um, that is, for example, allowing workers' representative to get inside into algorithms, um, to open this black box of algorithms when they are determining the working conditions. Um, and I think this is a very good example that should be adopted by other countries too, especially also by Germany. Excuse me, I have to drink. <laughs> and actually there is hope because the European Com um, Commission just published a draft for an AI Act, an act to regulate artificial intelligence in entire Europe, um, which is now in the uh, proceedings at the European Parliament. And um, I think it's a very important step to, especially for work in the gig economy, to regulate artificial intelligence. And um, it's important that the draft sees work-related algorithms in the field of high risk, which comes along with like stronger rules and legal uh, obligations of, for example, employers who use it. But the drag lacks individual rights for workers uh, when they are affected by AI. That's simply missing so far. And it blanks out collective action, which is a problem in my eyes after what I said before. Um, and that must be solved now in the legislative process in my eyes. Now looking at, the, um, at Germany, the German Federal Ministry of Labour uh, already in 2020 published a paper with key points to improve the situation of gig workers. And um, these key points in my eyes contain very important approaches and I really hope this will be implemented now um, by the new parliament. I don't know if you're aware, like we, we just had elections and we're waiting for the new parliament, um, for the new coalition to come together. There was rumors that um, maybe today the coalition contract is going to come out. There was a paper before um, that didn't mention gig economy and gig work situations, but hope dies last that something is going to happen because two parties in the coalition, the Social Democrats and the Green Party, had um, legal regulation for gig workers in their um, electoral programs. So there is hope that something might happen and the key points that are already there by the federal ministry are really helpful. So um, regulation for better work in the platform economy in my eyes, this is like the last chapter, I don't know how, I, how I'm in the time. Um, they need to focus on both aspects in my eyes. One is improving the working conditions really of platform workers as independent workers. And the second is uh, improving the bargaining position of those um, who are actually self-employed, who want to be self-employed or who will just not legally fit in the construct of being a dependent worker. And the proposal of the German Labour Ministry actually does have these two aspects um, in mind. And um, it includes a proposal to shift the burden of proof, which I mentioned before, um, I think is really important to improve enforcement of labor rights. But because bogus self-employment does not affect all forms of platform employment, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, it is also right in my eyes that the ministry, as key points, also want to improve the situation of solo self-employed workers. This is about their social security, about bringing them into social security systems. It's about effective data protection and about unfair contractual conditions, which are a problem for many self-employed in the platform field. And on platforms, algorithms regulate access to contracts and to income. And um, rating systems play an important role. And how these systems work, how the algorithms work, is usually completely non-transparent for the workers. It's a black box and it's controlled by the platform. And then 
the contract terms are set unilaterally, so only by the platform. It's like the idea of really a bargaining is just an idea. It's theoretical. It doesn't happen in practice. And so platforms are gatekeepers. And um, the Euro both the European Commission and the Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs want to take up this role as of platforms as gatekeepers. Um, in the legislation, and I think this is exactly the right way um, to, to address it. And then I mentioned already the draft of the Artificial Intelligence Act, which I think is really important, uh, for example, to get transparent, uh, transparency on algorithms. And then further on, um, it needs to be clarified by the lawmaker that mergers of solo self-employed workers for collective agreements are not um, in conflict with antitrust law. Um, we have this legal problem that um, it's not really clear if the European antitrust law infringes with collectives of solo self-employed bargaining together because um, this might be, um, what's the English word for this? Um, I don't find it. Cartel, that's the word, thank you. Yeah, it's the same like in German actually. So um, it has to be m made clear that it's not a cartel when they set together and we need to like clearly, clearly point this out in the law. Um, to make sure there's no conflict in that place. And because collective agreements, of course, are super important. So what are collectives about? Um, I believe the old rem remedy of solidarity among workers um, does help also to make work in the new platform working world better. Um, Co-determination and collective bargaining autonomy must be considered as decisive to improve working conditions. But the problem is, in the new world, the kind of old strategies of unions don't work well anymore. Um, old strategies such as talking to people when you see them, like convincing them to take place in something, flyers handed out or maybe the open door of um, an office of workers representatives to get in touch also with union subjects. This is dependent on a plan as a physical place. Um, it's dependent on people meeting somewhere in a work, like a physical working environment and in many um, places of gig and crowd work we don't have these physical places, we don't have plants in that sense anymore, but apps. And this is why one thing we, um, we really asked the lawmaker to apply, and this is also not only relevant for the gig economy, but also for companies and industries that have all their workers in mobile work in home offices. So to organize solidarity, labor unions and workers' representatives need to be able to reach the people and they reach them via digital channels, via apps, via chats, the intranet, emails. And we say unions need to um, have like a digital access to the workers in order to organize solidarity because this is the first step to be able to have collective agreements or workers' representatives. And I mean, we see, for example, Gorilla's Workers' Collective, they met they, because they have plans, actually, where they start the writing. They talk to each other. With Lieferando, for example, deliver, deliver the, the riders, they see the backpacks they have, so they see themselves in the city and can connect this way. Helpling workers, the women, they're completely like private. How can they connect? And connection is essential. So this is one, um, one claim that we have for the new lawmaker actually to quickly um, set up this digital access in order to organize people. And then, uh, <laughs> my last aspect, I'm not, not aware of the time, my last aspect is data protection. 
Data protection is um, crucial, both for dependent workers um, and not just as a worth for itself data protection. Data protection is um, about health, actually about psychological health, because being aware that your employer knows everything about how you structure your working day, about how fast you take out certain tasks, whatever kind of work you do, it puts pressure on you and um, you can see it in the health of people that this has um, effects. There's research on this already that points this out very clearly. So actually data protection is part of health protection of workers. Um, and I think this uh, will rise. I also do believe that at least in the German debate, we do not pay enough attention yet to data and the data of workers as um, a tool for power. And I think it's a very strong aspect in the gig economy. Um, I haven't gone far enough with like my thinking about this, but I have the feeling that in other countries in the US and in the UK, there's further thinking on data actually as property of workers, like with an economic worth. Um, in the work relationship and I think we have to discuss that further. What we definitely need here in Germany, I can't exactly say about the situation in other countries, is stronger data protection rights, like effective rights in the um, field of work where, for example, you don't really give a free consent, yeah, it's okay f for you, boss, to take all my data because people are not really signing contracts freely or arguing them freely. So I think I'm ending with this and I hope there is um, enough inspiration to um, discuss and thank you very much for the attention so far. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much, Johanna, for this excellent presentation. You were right in time, I think. And um, yeah, I will not say much, but uh, hand over the mic to Alessio for a response. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. Well, first of all, like, it was a very, very interesting and inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, I will also start with a little disclaimer uh, that I'm not a lawyer myself, so I don't have a law background. I have a more kind of a sociology and, and policy background, so I will try to give maybe a more sociological and policy um, kind of point of view on this. And I would start by the kind of topic of disruption, because you know, a lot of the kind of the platform economy is itself built on this narrative of this platform is something completely new. There are technology companies, they are not transport company or delivery companies. So there is a lot of narrative about uh, innovation and disruption. But as you rightly pointed out, I think that in a sense, a lot of the elements of the platform or the so-called gig economy are not new. And if we look kind of in historical perspective, you know, many of the jobs throughout the kind of first part of the industrial revolution and throughout the first half of the 20th century, in a sense, were also forms of gig work. They were casual, they were uh, peace rate, they have very little protections uh, and very little rights. Um, so in a sense, the gig economy is true. There are many new elements, but also many elements in common with in, in so-called earlier phases of um, capitalism. And uh, I think compared though to that historical phase, uh, I think as you highlighted with many kind of very clear and detailed example. We have now the tools, we have the institutions, we have the policies in place to act upon these uh, new forms of precarity and insecurity and, and low paid uh, work. And you, I think you very clearly um, highlighted what courts have done, what policy makers have done, and also what uh, unions are doing uh, in a sense to, um, to change uh, the current situation. And I think a, a bit kind of going uh, in contrast with, the, in a sense, this narrative of disruption and innovation, I think you've also shown that, you know, the laws, contrary to what also many platforms say, they're not all to be thrown away, they're not completely outdated, they're not completely anachronistic, but actually the sum of the elements of our employment regulation system, our labor law uh, framework can actually be applied. Uh, the case of employment status of uh, several German courts, but also many courts 
across the world have rightly said that this is not really a new form of work and this is not something that can be fit into previous category, but actually what courts have found is actually that these workers are employees. They are dependent uh, workers. So that in a sense the need for completely new categories, completely new frameworks and conceptualization of employment are not always needed. Um, but at the same time I think what was also very interesting is you, you also uh, made some very good example of adaptation. You know, these institutions, the unions, politicians and the courts themselves are adapting uh, the existing framework to the new needs and to the new um, questions and issues that uh, the gig economy uh, has been uh, creating. I mean, you cited the, the Spanish law and the kind of opening of algorithms. You mentioned the Artificial Intelligence Act uh, and several other legislative attempts to uh, kind of regulate uh, aspects of, of the gig economy. And I think overall, um, I think there is positive signs, I would say. There is encouraging signs that, in a sense, the tide is changing and that uh, this, in a sense, Wild West capitalism is uh, not there necessarily to stay and we can change things. And we also hope that the work we're doing with Fair Work can also contribute uh, to this and that uh, the showing also that what we're doing is showing that not all platforms are the same and the platform economy does not necessarily mean uh, worse working conditions doesn't necessarily mean instability, insecurity, doesn't necessarily mean lack of protections, uh, so that not everything is doomed, but we can also think of a platform economy that is more fair and decent for uh, all the workers. Uh, I just kind of end with a kind of word of caution, uh, that is, you know, as the, we've said that the tide has changed, but we need to make sure that as the tide changes, all boats are lifted that we don't forget, you know, the more invisible workers, you know, for example, the domestic workers, migrant workers, refugees, people with disabilities. So we don't forget that they also exist and we need to make sure that um, as the new regulations go in place, as courts act, as unions uh, are more active in the, in the platform economy, that they, these people are not forgotten. Um, thanks. Thank you, Alessio. Very interesting and insightful. Um, we have now um, space for questions, discussion questions. Um, if you want to ask a question to both uh, Johanna and Alessio, you can, you can go ahead. Um, I otherwise also have a couple of questions. Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. It was really interesting and yeah, I agree with a lot of stuff. Uh, where I slightly disagree or where I want, what I want to discuss is the, uh, the intro and you mentioned all these nice projects done by unions um, on crowd work and the gig economy. But I mean in general I think we need to be honest and uh, account for the fact that the big unions did not really do a lot of great stuff in this area and that they're playing catch up at best and that they are um, in some conflicts are still uh, not much of a help. And I think this, is, uh, this has some structural reasons. I think that unions still are not very well equipped to deal with self-employment and to organize self-employed workers. I think they have um, obviously big uh, issues in organizing migrant workers and then there's the problem of uh, digital technology which is new. And taken together, I mean, it's um, the, uh, arguably the, the gig economy and strikes and struggles in the gig economy have been the, the most visible and most important uh, labor conflicts in Europe in the last five, six years. And they've taken place by and large outside the scope of big unions. And I'm not saying this to, to blame unions, I'm saying this is a Verdi member who knows the people who work on self-employment and the people who do great work on migration. But um, I think that we need to push uh, Verdi and other unions to be more inventive, to be more conflictual, to be more creative here. And then maybe the, the projects you mentioned are the signs of a renewal. But if I look now at the Gorillas conflict, I'm actually not that sure that this really uh, fruitful discussion and development going on in unions. And I think this is a problem we're seeing in, in not only in Germany, but in the whole of Europe. 
So this is, uh, again, not to, to point fingers and blame that much, but I think we need to be honest here and, and see the failure of, uh, also the failure of the um, uh, established ways of labor conflict and the sort of conservatism of unions sticking with the established lines and not being able to be creative and take a risk for once. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I saw support for what you said and um, I'm thinking a lot of, about what you say. Um, I mean, because I think it's also a task for researchers to ask certain questions and um, I think I have questions um, that I try to find answers to. I think it's not so much about blaming but about really asking questions. I was on a big congress in the time when you could leave your country to meet other researchers and the Swedish uh, labor union, transport labor unions had uh, talked on their um, activism in the field of um, riders and um, gig work uh, companies and they said we're trying to think out of the box um, and especially in big and you mentioned the big unions because I think NGG for example is a very small union I mean a union financed by McDonald's workers and um, like precarious workers in the meat industry having like big struggles going on there now also dealing with this field I mean they do have industry work as well um, and I had talks for example with Ori Mittenmeier who is uh, like an active writer and organized Liefern am Limit about this organizing especially migrant workers and he says it takes time because um, it's like here in the big unions I was working for the um, IG Metall like um, where people for generations are union members and they enter the factory saying I'm a union member, my dad was, my granddad was um, and it's kind of normal to be a union member and there's not much um, to do but of course this is also changing because people are changing the mindset uh, like the, um, the um, self, um, rec like recognizing themselves as workers Many academic workers um, don't identify as a working class even though they are in independent work relationships. So besides the gig and crowd work, um, unions have to find new strategies to reach out for people and um, this is true not only in this field but also in others because um, the workforce they need to organize in order to be strong enough to lead um, um, like negotiations on collective agreements and you can like the power of a union in collective agreements which makes them stronger as a single person trying to um, negotiate its contract is strike and um, in order to be able to strike you need to be sure you have a certain amount of people in your back and this is what um, an NGG colleague told us um, in another on another platform session that they're trying to um, step by step convince writers to be part of the movement in order to at some point be strong enough um, for a collective agreement and negotiations with um, Lieferando for example and the questions I'm asking myself is for example um, because unions are based on membership it's really based on the commitment of taking part um, it's not like a climate strike for example where you go to a demonstration um, maybe are connected in a whatsapp group it has um, it's more a social relationship and um, the question i'm asking myself for example are these workers um, do they want to be part of a union this way, who is acting this way, who has democratic institutions? For example, the agreements made for, like, for negotiations, it's like set up in contracts who's part of the bargaining group, um, who's elected for this. This is democratic um, processes that it's not just a flash mob, yeah? it's a structure. And um, my experience, I mean, I tried organizing, for example, in the IG Metall, in the IT sector here in Berlin. 
and you have many precarious work in call centers, for example, and people do these jobs and as quickly as possible want to leave them because they're looking for something else. So I had two parts of people. One part are the people like we're fighting for and if we lose the job, it doesn't matter because it's dirt anyway. Like I find something that bad in the city somewhere else. But the second part is it's not worth investing my power of discussing with other unionists entire nights in order to organize, to have trouble in my working day because I hope to go anyway. So these are structural questions I have to ask and um, I think we need to discuss this um, for the labor union movement like above um, gig economy and crowd work. Maybe so far on that, uh, on that part, but absolutely right question. Yeah, thank you, Johanna. There are a couple of questions now. Um, maybe we can um, ask Pablo to um, pose a question that came from, um, from social media. Thank you. Yes, we have two questions from YouTube. Um, one of them is from Jonathan Miller uh, from the Tech Workers Coalition in Berlin. And uh, he asked uh, that he would like to hear more about the risks and consequences of the franchising model that companies, platforms like Gorillas, are using now um, and are determined to push through. So what does this kind of fragmented work sites model would mean? Um, and then if I can ask another question uh, already. Then uh, Kelly also uh, is asking us on YouTube and saying sorry for not being able to be live. But uh, her question is about whether you could talk about suggestions on how we can resist future regulatory initiatives being hijacked by platforms. So we often call, we often hear from platforms calling for regulation, but it's often because they want to write the regulation themselves. So how can we prevent this? Johan, do you want to answer now? Should we collect? Um, maybe I answer these two questions um, more quickly than I <laughs> did before. The franchising model, yeah, it's a classical construct to actually um, um, undermine labor law constructions because labor law works with um, definitions, a definition of a plant, for example, or what I talked about before, the definition of who's a worker. This is like, these definitions are open, as we saw in the cases I mentioned, to new interpretations, but that has limits. And um, of course, when you have an expensive lawyer as an employer, he is looking for your way to go beyond those um, definitions in order to make use of gaps. And I actually said in, in, in my speech that um, we do have those gaps because the idea of a plant as an app with people like on different places across the country is, is not really covered by the German Betriebsverfassungsgesetz. So it's a classical strategy that the Gorillas employer now used and lost actually um, in, in the courts um, that we know from other companies. And this is referring also to the first question, something I forgot to say because you said um, the union, um, like the, the, they made the most visible strikes in the gig economy. Um, this is something I'm asking myself because I'm looking at many strikes and um, I was really impressed for example by the strikes of the women working in the um, uh, in the uh, food shop sector yeah handle um, um, sitting on the cash uh, decks uh, they earn very very little wage and may, many of them are part-time workers and they went on strikes to get their few cents over minimum wage and I found social media a little bit not enough interested into this and also the press and why is this? Um, um, because I do think that especially for um, left-wing researchers, politics Gorillas as this underdog, for example, 
they have a certain aura that is interesting and um, I think like it's it's not the power of strikes but it's it's also the reception of society and people being interested in strikes that's my critique in that field so um, this franchising model is a concept employers do in many other cases too um, it's it's not special for the gig economy but as I said in my speech in the gig economy it's easier for employers to use uh, these gaps and to um, kind of make a digital system of how work is provided without a docking station as a plant. So this to the first uh, question and the second question, if I got the, an the, the question right, my answer would be lobbying work. Um, I think it's really like what you do here now, discuss the working situation, explain society and politics what's going on um, and be in contact with, with working people and this is why I think gorillas is important for the entire labor movement because of course they are getting the attention of the press for example for the struggles of workers in the 21st century and this is what we need in order to get, I think the regulator gets pressure a good example, for example, from Germany was the meat industry. We're talking, like, in, in, as researchers and unionists, we talk about the horror conditions in the meat industry for workers, migrant workers as well, since decades. And no really big shift happened. And then we had the corona crisis and many cases, and suddenly the press realized how the working conditions of these people are and there were newspaper articles and interviews and, and politics reacted. So I really think that also your fair work, you mentioned this, your fair work research is important um, to be able to explain society the relevance of certain legal regulation. So far on this, I hope this, it's answered. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I saw a lot of hands um, before, and maybe we'll just start with you. I can't yeah, thank see you so the much for, um, for the presentation. Uh, it was very interesting, and uh, many interesting ideas caught my attention. Also, I want to preface with the fact that I'm not a lawyer, but I work with lawyers and follow labor legislation changes um, somewhat. And so I actually have two questions. Um, one idea that I heard during your presentation uh, is very fascinating, is that uh, you mentioned about channels for unions to reach people digitally. And I don't hear about that often, to have that digital access to workers. How do you think that could be actionalized and how do you balance that with the right to privacy and data protection? Because, you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, reaching into, uh, I guess, the same realm of taking over the data of the workers. So that's my first question. And second uh, was about what you mentioned about the need for no one size fit all solution. So need for different labor contracts. In Ukraine, we've sort of had that as an example. So um, our legislator, Legislators um, created a law um, and made gig contracts possible for one category of workers, the IT workers. But then what happened was that uh, some firms circumvented that. Uh, so for example, we have an auto, automotive um, manufacturer who circumvented that by saying that as automotive manufacturers, they are also with the IT technology. And so they also took advantage of the gig contracts that were proposed for one category of workers and claimed that they have the right to it. And so this became a foot in the door for further violation and for further implementation of the minimum standard rather than the better standard. So how to um, have this like, uh, I guess, solutions that are like contracts that are different and that satisfy the needs of the workers who want to be self-employed while, while that not having uh, to become like a foot in the door for violation. So I would like to hear your reflection on that. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Can I answer immediately? I'm afraid I, <laughs> I will lose it. That was really, really good questions uh, because they really address exactly the focus of problems. So the first one that you said, um, 
what if unions get digital access, um, how does this um, uh, go together with um, data protection? That's exactly what the employers say. So um, right now, um, the um, chemical um, branch union is having uh, a legal conflict with uh, a big clothing company with many workers, actually all workers, I think, being in mobile work and home office. And they say, um, we want to use the internet to bring our um, um, union uh, messages directly to the people's home to reach them and the employer says no you can't because data protection and I think this is because um, the right for collective um, agreement and to make a coalition with other workers is a basic right it's in the German Constitution it's in the Charter of um, Human Rights of the European Union um, so you have to weigh like these two rights and saying a first access of the union, for example, sending an email um, or a message, I think um, like in the app, it's, it's probably a chat system saying like, hi, this is your union officer. If you have any question, contact me here. Um, like I will not contact you again if you don't, if you don't want or you can sign out um, if you don't want to get on news. Um, there are solutions for these questions. But the problem right now that, and this is your question actually is the reason why we think it needs to be regulated to make clear that you can have the access, it has to be balanced with data protection rights, but data protection right cannot be used by the employer as an excuse to keep the union out of their communication systems. Yeah? Um, so this is, this is the idea. And the second question, wow, yeah, there's so much like discussion among lawyers about these questions of categories. And uh, of course, the discussion is not finished yet, but I think it's dangerous. I think that's the direction that you were arguing. It's dangerous to make new categories of workers because there's always the chance of misuse. So it's better to clearly be with, we have labor law and labor protection rights applying to anyone who is a worker. Um, and then to have a definition of a worker, as I tried to explain, um, on the case that is adapting personal dependence in a digital working world. And um, so this is why the judgment by this, um, this, in this precedent case of Germany was so important actually. Um, and then it's clear from what I see, like how I see the research on what kind of working conditions do we have in crowd work, for example, crowd work, click work. It, it will not be possible to um, sum these working contracts up as workers, uh, as working contracts in the legal definition. So we will talk about self-employed and then the second step is um, securing self-employment and I'm not finished with think, like thinking how to do it because with platforms they are not operating on free markets. Um, the platforms have um, monopolies in many senses and I mean just looking at what's going on for example in, um, in Berlin with like sports courses, yoga courses, um, people who were self-employed before suddenly have these monopolies of platforms who bring them clients or can take them away from them. And this is about um, actually ruling uh, or making legal rules for monopolies to improve those little solo self-employed um, and what we discuss under this aspect is giving more focus on economic dependency. Like they have no, the platform is not telling them which course to offer, like staying with the example of yoga, which course to offer, offer on what place, or for what price. But here we go into the number because they make a comparison of all the yoga classes in your area being offered and um, you can either be on or not and the more people having the app of the platform on their phone will choose a course which is found on the app. 
So at the end, yoga teaching classes are not a free market anymore. And how do we regulate this? This is something I think we have to think about besides getting all people who are dependent workers in that legal category. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we can take one or two more questions and then um, wrap it up. I'm having back and forth whether to ask this question or not, if it's a question at all. I was at the court this morning with the Gorillas workers and things, things are very emotional there. You can see it in the courtroom. Um, you can see it outside. Some of them basically told me, I hope this is the last time that I see this place. You're talking about Arbeitsgericht and uh, Magda Wilgetplatz. And we know that that's not true. They're probably going to be back there again. In fact, they're also there tomorrow because a couple of workers that were fired have another case tomorrow. And guess what? This is probably the 12th, 14th, 15th, I lost number, I lost count case. Today was the big case, obviously, um, with last week's case as well, the union busting case. And the case is also not closed. I mean, sure, uh, the judge basically acknowledged that, yes, it's union busting, you can't do it, but left the door open for franchising, which probably means that sometime next year in 2022, Gorilla is going to be facing the Works Council again, it's Martin, the, uh, the lawyer, uh, once again sitting there, putting his heart out, trying to make a case. So I guess the question, if it's a question, is what are, where are the repercussions? Are, we're talking about a, a workforce, majority of which, is, which comes from different countries, that are already working in precarious situations that don't have the funds necessarily always to keep on going to court day after day. They have work to do, they have schools to attend to. So who is there to help them really? Because the companies, the platforms, they can keep on bringing them to court. They can, the, comp the platforms themselves can be brought to court day after day. They don't care, they have the means for it, they have the time for it, they have the lawyers for it. Every court case I've been seeing different lawyers in, in, the, in the courtroom. The, what, what, where, what, is the, what is the outcome of all of this? Should there be, we're talking about regulation, perhaps the question is should there be repercussions for this kind of, um, these kinds of maneuvers, uh, union busting included? It's a difficult question <laughs> because it's kind of telling what's going to happen in the future. Um, I think in a way that the employer of Gorillas is acting in a special way because um, he, he like kind of had this curve of like first being like we are a family and it's, it's great that you're striking and I like democracy and then trying to prevent like with all uh, legal weapons you can lose, uh, you can use uh, and then lose actually in court um, to prevent a works council and I already predicted um, that there will now be the voting of the council and then there's another legal remedy you can use against the works council and they will probably use it uh, because it seems to be their strategy now to like try anything to, um, to prevent it and we see um, again, not only in platform economy that there, are, but I mean the AB5 example that I talked about is one example that, I mean employers are looking at investments and obviously it's still cheaper to invest into um, legal disputes and expensive lawyers or ballots uh, initiatives like in California than into investing in good working conditions better working conditions. Um, and I mean, having a works council in Germany also means an investment because um, it's people, um, you have to like, they have certain rights, you have to pay for them, you have to give them a room. Um, that's why they don't want it, but it's not so much about the money fact, I'm sure, with the um, works council. It's about, and this is something we see in many startups, especially not only in the gig economy, that 
democracy is something that takes too long for the business model they have. Like they just don't want to spend time on discussing with people and they're like, yeah, we can have, I, I mean, I think gorillas even set something like, like this up. We will have talking groups or how, however they call it, but this is nothing that is giving workers' representatives strong rights to say no to certain plans of an employer. And I mean, there's fights about this in other sectors of the industry because the world of work is, world of work is changing everywhere and we need more rights of work councils to keep a digitalized working world democratic. And I think this is about good regulation, the question that you ask, because if there is a good regulation with small gaps, and I mean, I also worked um, for law firms on the employer side during my education as a lawyer, and they come and say, okay, I have this problem, they want a works council or they want a collective agreement, what can I do? And if there is a chance for them to go beyond the law, of course, some of them will choose to do so because the chance um, is higher um, to have a more effective way this way. But if regulation um, is working, it will prevent, like if you have strong sanctions, for example, for certain situations, this is also preventing employers from a certain behavior because if, they, if their strategy fails, it's going to be very expensive for them. This is why, for example, we say with the AI Act, it will only work if the sanctions are high enough um, to prevent um, employers to use certain systems. It's working in the field of data protection. The data protection law has very high sanctions. Um, and this works, but this is a decision of the lawmaker to make labor law this way and uh, the problem is that not only digitalization but also globalization um, is opening so many doors to avoid labor law it's really hard to kind of follow this up we see this in the meat industry that i mentioned we see it in the platform economy but we even see it in classical industries the option of taking out entire jobs to countries with very different working conditions um, puts pressure on um, like the worth of work in each country. And um, this is why I think it's very important also to look at international labor law. And this is why it's important what you guys are doing here to kind of connect internationally because um, global work needs global solutions. Maybe I'll end with this. I don't know about the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. That, um, was, um, that were some good ending words. Um, uh, yeah, and I think you really showed that um, both in the talk and um, in the question session that we are dealing with um, a very contested terrain um, and that battles are still being fought at, at kind of the very moment. And um, yeah, I think um, let's not just hope, but also work um, towards um, um, supporting these, these battles um, um, from a movement side uh, perspective, from researchers, from a union perspective. Um, I think, um, yeah, um, regulation does not come by itself. Um, so it's important to have these discussions, but also then um, to implement concrete action following on it. Before, um, yes, so um, thank you both. Thank you, uh, Johanna, and thank you, Alessio. Uh, before I close, I want to um, uh, um, hint to our final panel, um, which will take place on Thursday. Uh, as uh, Johanna already said, there will be um, a member of the Gorillas Worker Collective, um, which we now talked about so much. Um, so it's time to hear them too. So um, Zeynep Kalidak uh, from Gorillas Worker Collective will be there. And um, also Jonathan Miller um, from Tech Workers Collective, uh, who, who I think asked a question today too. Um, and Alessio Bertolini will be back. Um, <laughs> so, um, 
Yes, um, a warm recommendation uh, for this event. And yeah, I hope you have a good evening and see you soon. Thank you.